And thanks for coming. Thanks for hanging out uh, till the end. Uh, and thanks for the organizers for giving us, us an opportunity to talk about multiomics and, and systems biology as it relates to innovation in the space. My name is Aaron Del Duca. I'm the VP Technology at DNA Genotech. Um, we're in the business of uh, sample collection devices and stabilization technology. Uh, and recently, um, through a transaction, we've merged uh, with, with CoreBiome to go from sampling up front through to big data generation and analysis. And uh, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful for this group um, to kind of coalesce around the topic of multiomics and systems biology because at DNA Genotech, we really do believe that the future of the microbiome space is, is multiomics uh, in nature. And to, to kick things off, you're wondering why I've got like some architecture photos up there. But um, Louis Kahn was a, was a master architect and he gave a, an infamous lecture um, back in the day, um, 50s and 60s on design and, and construction. And in, in this lecture, he had a hypothetical conversation um, with a brick. And in his words, you say to a brick, what do you want, brick? And the brick says to you, I like an arch. Um, and you say to the brick, look, I want one too, but arches are expensive and I can use a concrete lintel. And then you say, what do you think about that, brick? And brick says, I like an arch. And I think what, what Louis Kahn is reminding us here is that you know when there's a lot of different possible ways of moving forward, we have to look at our materials um, for inspiration and direction. <clears throat> and I think the arch is a really great analogy for what we're pull pulling together here in this room um, with, with these sorts of stakeholders. <clears throat> it's super multidisciplinary and it requires really robust frameworks in chemistry, biology, statistics, really, to meaningfully integrate omics data and help it all hang together and support the things that are yet to be built on what we're building. So, and I think that's our goal, it's our aspiration, is to really not just, you know, uncover things, but build things, foods, therapeutics, diagnostics. And so we need to be able to study it in a way that helps us understand its nature and its function. And the systems biology perspective is, I think, a really powerful way forward. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the gang here and have them introduce themselves and uh, give us a little bit of insights on um, some of the things that you're working on at the, at the moment. All right, so I'll, uh, I'll kick off. I'm uh, David Rigler. I'm a postdoc in Pam Silver's lab at Harvard Medical School, and I've been here for the last five years. Uh, but in seven weeks' time, I'll be moving to start my own group at Imperial College in London. Um, and my research uh, focuses on using synthetic biology approaches to try and engineer bacteria as tools that we can use to better understand and hopefully use uh, the microbiome uh, to understand um, sort of the mammalian <coughs> gut environment. And so uh, I think from, from the perspective of this discussion, uh, I kind of sit maybe on the, the back end of, of what we get out of a sort of potential multiomics studies uh, and trying to develop tools and techniques that we can use uh, to both uh, confirm the, the output of those studies and then also hopefully use those uh, potentially in things like living engineered um, therapeutics and probiotics uh, to translate that uh, into the clinic. Thanks. I'm Dan Knights. I'm an uh, associate professor at the University of Minnesota and also the CEO and co-founder of Core Biome. I uh, trained in computational biology. Uh, I've been working in the microbiome field since the early days of the Human Microbiome Project. Um, and since then have really uh, developed a love for um, the field and for big data. You know, I uh, came with kind of a machine learning training and one of the things that frustrated me for a long time about the field is kind of this lack of access to high quality big data sets. Um, and so I've been, you know, in my own research lab developing new methods for getting more information out of the features of the microbiome. Uh, but and also running clinical studies and running other types of microbiome studies and a couple of years ago started core biome with some of my collaborators to try to um, give access to shotgun metagenomics to anybody who wanted it at very large scale um, so the goal of core biome is really just to uh, accelerate the industry by providing access to, to big data and good data um, and then uh, to connect that to the analysis methods to gain insights. So I'm kind of in two roles right now, which I think, um, you know, although it's a little crazy making, it gives me access to 
like what's happening on the industry side and also what it's like to try to do science in the microbiome field. Hi, uh, everybody. Thanks again for sticking around. My name is Annie Evans. I'm from Metabolon. I'm actually the uh, Director of Research and Development. Um, so a lot of technology development. I'm not a biologist at all, so I, I'm full disclaimer. Um, I do a lot of, uh, or the focus of Metabolon is small molecule characterization, right? So we actually want to, within this space, understand what all the bugs, again, I call them bugs because I'm not a biologist, um, what are the bugs doing in the gut, right? We know or we believe to say that they are having their effect on the host by small molecules. So by understanding those small molecules that are being produced, by characterizing those small molecules, we can start to better understand mechanism of action and also poten potentially find other actionable targets. So. You know, we're very much engaged within this space to um, not only understand sort of in combination with which species are there, what are those species doing, and can we better mine that side of it. Um, in addition to a lot of the untargeted discovery work, um, we do also some, you know, targeted analysis for, for particular classes of molecules, which you guys have already talked a lot about having uh, known to be very important. So my name is Stefan Reiling. I'm a computational scientist for Kaleido Biosciences. Uh, at Kaleido, we are a company that is not trying to change the microbiome by introducing new taxa or, or FMTs, but we're trying to modulate the microbiome and we're trying to modulate the function of the, micro, of the microbiome in the, in, in the human host. So we, we run assays um, ex vivo, we already are running clinical studies in the human host. We do sequencing of the microbiome, but we also look at functional readouts of the microbiome in ex vivo and in clinical studies. I'm also not a biologist. <laughs> I'm a long time ago. I actually have a background in computational chemistry, but I've been working in the drug discovery with, in large pharmaceutical companies for 20 years, so there's not much chemistry left in me, I have to say. <laughs> Thanks. So um, we've got expertise ranging from, you know, big data generation, reading microbiomes, um, reading their, their byproducts, um, and even writing and engineering <laughs> microbiomes. So I think we've got some really great coverage uh, for the topic. And I'm going to open it up for a really interactive session, so, so stay tuned. But I think as innovators in this space, a lot of what we do, um, aside from creating our technologies and, and you know discovering things, is we're also writing a language so that people can kind of tune in and, and understand um, what's going on as best as we can. So I'd like Dan and, and Stefan, if you could kick us off with some definitions on what multiomics analysis really does mean to you and how it relates to microbiome research. Well, so I would say, um, I mean, there, people have different definitions, but to keep it really simple, multiomics just means you're combining two or more data types. That's, you know, at a very basic level. So it could be like the, micro, the gene expression in the microbiome and gene expression in the host, or it could be the, the DNA in the microbiome and the metabolome in the microbiome, um, you know, two or more of those. And I think, um, you know, we're also talking about systems biology, which is more of a framework for analyzing multiomics data and for thinking about complex systems. Yeah, similar to this, I would, I would describe this as an ohm is always the, in, the entirety of something. So you have the genome, metabolome, proteome, transcriptome, and so on. And you specifically run experiments where you try to capture at least parts of these different ohms in your in your experiment, and then you, you're, you're trying to look across the ohms to establish correlation or associations between one, for example, the genome and the proteome or metabolome. Okay, that, I think that's a, a helpful grounding for sure. Um, and if I had to ask you to put your, your sales hats on for a second um, and, and give us your perspective on the kinds of information and the kinds of perspectives that, that we can only gain by taking a multiomics or systems biology perspective that we would have a really hard time achieving any other way, what, what would some of those things be? And that's open to everybody. 
jump on that. I'll, I'll make it a little easier. Um, <laughs> even if you can think of an example or a breakthrough or an insight that you know you in collaboration or you independently kind of stumbled across, like yes, multiomics really cracked that for me. I feel like I'm so shamelessly biased. I'm almost embarrassed to to talk. Um, so I feel like um, there are actually, within the research that we've done at Metabolon, some really exciting findings tying the incredible research that we've seen over the last two days where you start identifying these species that are present. A particular example that I can think of is we were working with an autism spectrum disorder model where they had you know, characterized the different species within, um, and as we all know, autism spectrum disorder is a spectrum disorder. Getting classifications of the different subgroups can be incredibly challenging within the industry. So they are really looking for help to help striate patients as they can. So they had these incredibly different models where they were able to striate, you know, it looks like, you know, these population of strains are more associated with this subgroup of autism, and they went through that. And that was beautiful findings within purely the sequencing uh, uh, information. They went on to, to add the metabolomics and were able to actually tie a particular molecule being produced by the, the bacteria in one of these models and then go back and subsequently induce the autism characteristics in some mouth, mouse models by adding and doping uh, that mouse with that. So you can start to see this pure circle of biology coming together with, okay, now we see that these microbiota are associated with this phenotype, and they're having their action on the neurological system by producing a metabolite that is absorbed by the host, um, and that is then making its way to the neurological system and actually crossing the blood-brain barrier to have an effect on disrupting uh, neurological function. It, the only way to have that entire circle come together was through a multiomics approach. Um, and I asked someone yesterday, like, does it make it easier to get through regulations if you can sort of explain to people how, how it's having its action? And I think the response is, well, it's going to make your life easier. Um, so I think on the road to let's make everybody's life easier, because we see the power of probiotics, we see the power of prebiotics. If we can start to understand the how, it might make the regulators a little more likely to listen to us and, and let, it, let it through if you can say this is how it's working. Um, I think I'll, I'll sort of build on that, and I think generally, um, for me, the, the big thing is that once we can start to put these things together, that it is really like getting closer from causation to actual uh, mechanism um, from a biological perspective that excites me about putting different ohms together. Um, and I think that still the data that comes out is associative, but once you can actually uh, sort of identify a gene pathway in a bacteria, then you can actually start to do the sort of basic scientific um, sort of data collection, et cetera, and experiments where you can start to complement, you can start to knock out genes, et cetera. And from a synthetic biology perspective, we can also then start to move those pathways into new bacteria where you might put it into a, a safer probiotic that you could then express um, that therapeutic uh, or potentially um, molecule of interest from. So, so having that, that closer step to mechanism is, I think, really important. So in the, uh, the microbiome field is still a, a new area for drug discovery, um, but as an example where this has been pretty much established now is in uh, drug discovery for cancers, where you have these large panels of cancer cell lines that are genomically typed and then you run transcriptomics analyses on these. So that's one of the first steps for, for discovering of, of new cancer drugs that has been, that, that has, is routinely applied in the field. Some powerful examples in there. Good? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> so um, maybe, maybe a softball, but I mean, <clears throat> why do you think not everybody in the room is kind of taking this approach um, today, um, what do you think some of the big constraints are? Um, is it, I mean, certainly, you know, um, funding and expertise asymmetry, but um, what about study designs and, and strategies, strategies in general? Are there um, specific approaches that are not widely understood yet to really um, enable this to, to scale with, with quality? So the way that I would look at this is that um, the microbiome field has just established how to run good 
metagenomic studies on stool samples. And this has yet to be established for some of the other omics areas, like spe specifically like transcriptomics or also metabolomics. It's just not a common pract practice at this point yet, but there is definitely interest in these things and sample handling, sample integrity and so on is still something that needs to be addressed for these kind of omics studies. But I, but I really think that once that has been worked out, uh, especially with transcriptomics, I could see this as just as a standard thing that you would do going forward. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think there are a lot of capabilities, incredible capabilities for doing some of these things, but they don't necessarily work at scale yet. And so we're now at the point where we can generate massive amounts of genomic data and kind of answer like who's there and what are they doing or at least what might they be doing through DNA, but we don't have the ability to flip a switch and generate a massive metatranscriptomics data set and then generate a massive metabolomics data set um, and combine the two, you know, it, at least in a, in a kind of cost-effective way. Um, so I think scale and technologies that enable that scale are gonna be really important. I think the only thing I would add to the discussion is um, you know, certainly we know that metabolomics has not had a great offering for, you know, particularly fecal. We, you know, we've got, you know, plasma very well established, but fecal has always been a bit of a difficulty because uh, fresh frozen is the standard. And, I'm, you know, I, nobody wants to go to a clinic and, and poop in a clinic. It's just, it's ick and, and people are uncomfortable doing that. So we've been really working to try to figure out how can we make it easier collection um, at the point so that it can be easier for the people who are already doing the sequencing, uh, you know, with at-home collection, how can, we, how can we help drive that for metabolomics as well? And, and we believe that just by having some of the better tools for people, um, that it'll make it a little bit more uh, widely usable, um, whereas right now it's, it's, it's more difficult. I can certainly say that, and it's a limitation as it stands now, but we hope to, we hope to shift that. We hope to shift that. Um, just one thing to add, I think, from an academic perspective, I think because of, I mean, these same challenges, um, I think that the academic kind of model doesn't necessarily perfectly fit for such major sort of large scale, large cost, cross laboratory um, collaborations at the moment, just in terms of things like how you get rewards and in terms of first and last authorship on papers, um, as well as sort of how publishing works where, you know, you send a paper off and it has two to three reviewers, but they aren't necessarily going to be actual experts across a broad multi uh, sort of field publication. And so uh, I realize that a lot of those things have potentially been solved or aren't as big issues uh, across industry, but I think that there are interesting kind of things to think about in terms of the structure of academia in this kind of space as well. And, and correct me if I'm wrong here, there's also, and, and I think Dan mentioned this a little bit, that you know, even if you had all the money in the world and you collected the most comprehensive, uh, you know, genomic, transcriptomic, metabolomic, the software tools to visually and easily incorporate all that data together and really profoundly make impact of it is really in its nascency, right? Um, and I, I'm always out there, every time I see a software company, I'm like, are they doing it yet? Are they doing it yet? And the answer is no, and so a lot of labs are having to either write their own solutions or pull together their own teams to do this, and it's really costly, and it takes a lot of time, and so I think there's a need within this community to, to be able to make use of the multiomics. I think the power of the technology is there, but if we can't, in a software package that allows us to mine that data more easily, it, it, it's, it's gonna be a challenge moving forward until that, uh, until it's addressed. I like where we're going. I mean, we're, we're talking about sort of the, the fundamentals of it, um, collaboration, right, to get multiomics. It's gonna take expertise from a whole bunch of different domains, funding and incentives and, and so forth. Um, and, and ultimately our goal is to, to connect the ohms, right, we gotta connect the ohms. Um, how can synthetic biology help us out in that regard specifically? So this is, this is sort of a hard question to answer quickly because I think synthetic biology is kind of a catch-all term and a, quite a diverse field. And so there are many different ways you could imagine uh, sort of an impact. But I think uh, for me, there's a really exciting kind of intersect between uh, a few technologies that synthetic biologists <coughs> have either developed or um, sort of adopted. Um, and so they include uh, sort of DNA synthesis technologies, which are rapidly decreasing in cost and increasing in scale. 
And then when you put that together with uh, new and developing technologies for uh, genome editing of an increasing range of bacteria, uh, as well as um, at higher scales, so there are companies and, and you know, it's, it's, there is potential now to start to look at engineering um, on the scale of, of whole bacterial genomes even, uh, which is, I think, really exciting. And then finally, putting together, I think, a lot of increasing knowledge in how gene expression works uh, and uh, being able to make targeted changes that we can rationally, say, change transcription and translation rates or change protein degradation rates. And so you can really start to put those things together and take some of the uh, sort of insights or hypotheses you can generate from a multiomics study and, and really start to imagine how you could take, you know, uh, tens to hundreds of KBs of, of DNA that might have a whole biosynthetic pathway on it, um, and then start to tweak with that and play with it to engineer it and, or knock it out to work out whether it is actually the mechanism for whatever the phenotype you've been looking at. Uh, and then ultimately, hopefully, we can then also start to play around with those kind of things as a, a mechanism to, uh, to interface with the microbiome as uh, probiotics or supplement, as, um, uh, performance enhancers, therapeutics, et cetera. And so I think that there's some, some really exciting uh, interplay that can, can happen in that space. So empirical validation, you gotta, you gotta put these things into practice and make it work, turn it on, turn it off. Couldn't agree more. Um, but especially since, you know, this, uh, the, the talk that preceded the break, you know, one of, my, one of my favorite questions is, we have to figure out how to model this stuff, right? Um, and there's, there may be a couple different camps in the room about, you know, hypothesis-driven research and sort of the black box, machine learning and artificial intelligence sort of driven discovery. Um, which one's going to win the day? Let's start with that. A little controversial. <laughs> so so I'm, I think I'm, on this question, I have, I have my, two, my two heads. On the one hand is the, sci is the scientist who wants to understand things. On the other hand is the machine learner who just makes a model and then hopes for the best. Um, and I think that is going to be ultimately where this is going to divide. Do you want to learn something about biology or the underlying function of the microbiome, for example, or do you want to have a model that you can use to stratify patients or use it for other, for, for other good purposes? So in this, if, if you just want to have a model that works, you don't care, and you would run the experiments accordingly and, and, and manipulate the data accordingly, if you really want to understand what is going on, then you probably would use the omics, multi-omics as a first entry point to do a broad profiling and then drill down in, into specific aspects of what you, what you see in your multi-omic studies. And so it, that is going to be where I think it's going to be the divider. I think it's a good question, and, and I think it's kind of both. Um, I, I agree that you can have these two-stage processes where, you know, you do mining for kind of the discovery step, and then you drill, yeah. drill in, and you do some, you know, causal testing, maybe use synthetic biology. I also think that People often conceptualize machine learning as a black box where you just give it a ton of inputs and you get an answer, and it either works or it doesn't. But if you look at the field of machine learning and AI over the last like, 20 years, there's always a point at which for, for whatever um, task it is people are trying to solve, you have experts translating what's going on in the world into features that the machine learning can understand. Um, and once you get it into the right language, the right sets of features, and you put some kind of structures around the data and inform the machine learning about it, then it becomes much, much more powerful. Um, so I think that's actually, it, it's the combination of the two. It's, you know, having people who are experts in the mechanisms, in the biology, who can inform the people designing the machine learning algorithms and kind of offload the the human expert knowledge of those structures into the algorithm so that it gets much more power out of the data. Okay, so we're, we're kind of transitioning into some of the more fun stuff around, around models um, and, and some of the specific ones that, you know, I've heard um, folks much smarter than me talk about are, are things like, you know, um, flux balance analysis. Um, 
what are some of the, the strengths or advantages of taking an approach like this and, and where are some of the big limitations? I could start with that. <clears throat> yeah, so this actually it's, um, it ties into what, to what I was just talking about where you know, there's sort of like this bottom-up approach where you understand and model every detail of what's happening and you create this, this systems biology model where you know, in theory, you can predict exactly what's gonna happen for given an input and output. And I think that, I mean, it's extremely powerful and it has been shown to work for communities of like a few microbes, um, but actually making that work for a human microbiome is basically intractable because every strain has its own um, slightly different set of metabolic inputs and outputs and biomass requirements and things like that. And then even the same strain in different people might have slightly different requirements because of the, you know, the environment and the diet and the, like, the host metabolites and things like that. So I, I see those as like that's the structure that we need to somehow combine with the big data and the machine learning so that we're getting the benefits of all of that knowledge we know about the, the methods know about the metabolic networks. They know that this compound gets, you know, goes through this reaction through this enzyme, which comes from these genes. Like we have to have that information in there. And so I, I'm kind of a believer in that, you know, ha having that data, having the structures built in as much as possible, but then still driving the discovery through feeding in lots and lots of data rather than trying to fully model out the whole system from the bottom up. I think that's gonna take much, much longer, like thousands of years longer. <laughs> and also one, one thing to keep in mind about flux balance analysis about these specific models is that basically the, the input is what constrains the model in the biomass accumulation and also in, and, and in the outputs. So if you know exactly what the input is that goes into your system, they can work pretty well and they are, they are employed for uh, uh, biofuels, for example, to optimize the, these bacteria. But as long as we are not entirely sure what ends up in the colon and what is the actual dietary input to the microbiome, there is, there is gonna be quite a bit of uncertainty with this. If you can go into like an ex vivo and have a very controlled setting, this, this could work really well. We have not, we have not done this in, in, in a whole lot of detail. So to, to really get at this, I think, you know, we, we're hearing about, you know, function and mechanism um, for sure. And when we think about the, the things that are accessible to us, the, the materials, I guess, to, in keeping with the building analogy, um, how can we use FMT, you know, sort of a, an intervention to help us understand that? I mean, assuming the, the regulatory landscape relaxes a little bit and we can, we can use this more broadly for controlled research purposes. but. Um, what are some of the advantages or disadvantages to using FMT and, and perturbation studies to help us get at these, these essential bits of information? I think, I mean, one, one of the great things about FMT is that it's scaled up so quickly. You know, so, I mean, there's FMT trials in many diseases you know, that, are, that are happening today, um, whereas, you know, it takes much, much longer to develop a, a cocktail of microbes, get it approved for a trial, and so on. So I think it the FMT lets us get started right away, and it's working, and it's incredibly exciting. I think it's more just that that feeds into the multiomics because the tricky part is figuring out why did it work, like why did it why did this FMT work in this patient and not the other, mm -hmm. and to get to that you have to find out okay, what are the inputs to the system, what were the bugs doing, like what genes did they turn on what was the starting point you know, before you did the FMT, and then what are the outputs, the byproducts? Mm -hmm. So I would say it's, FMT's great, the challenge is figuring out how it's working, and the multi-omics is the way to do that. I think the one thing I really like about FMT is the idea that um, it is the perfect control, right? It's almost the closest you're gonna get to precision medicine in that you're going to establish, hopefully, the sort of what the individual person looked like before the transplant. And then in that same person, their same 
genetic host genotic profile, what do they look like afterward? It is the perfect control system. Um, and as again, as we understand that as a population, we are diverse, we are incredibly heterogeneous. Um, and you know, we, we joke around, we call humans free range humans, right? And it, it's, it adds a lot. And so the FMT model is fantastic in that you can monitor a single person over time and statistically, uh, as well as scientifically, that adds a lot of, of power to the analysis. So if, if, you think, if you think of FMT as a perturbation or basically an, an intervention, I think that's definitely the way to go. And hopefully there's going to be a lot more data that is going to be published going forward about perturbations of the microbiome in animal models or, or in, in human hosts. Um, but the comment that I would like to make is that with FMTs, it depends on how well defined or how much you actually know what the composition of your perturbation is. Mm -hmm. So there might be other perturbations that you could apply to the microbiome that are better defined and, and, and higher precision than, than FMT. Any recommendations on that? So it could be single strain, it could be a defined community. I mean, at Kaleido, we, we favor um, our glycans or our MMTs that are that, that, that are well defined um, and they're not absorbed by the uh, by the host. Um, you could also think of other uh, perturbations with exo with exomes or other crazy ideas that are that, that are being that, that are be that are floating around. I think to add to that, um, also like phage therapy, for instance, is a potential where you can imagine really specifically targeting uh, one strain of bug or even potentially uh, trying to target genes within a certain strain of drug, um, bug. Um. So to, to help, you know, translate, in fact, we're at, you know, the Translational Microbiome Conference. Um, we, we have to, I think, ground this in, in sort of the, the tools and methodologies and, and the approaches. Um, and I think we've covered some really interesting areas so far, but what are some of the essential standards um, that we need to develop as a community to really help us um, meta-analyze and, and build on, you know, things and, and progress forward? Anybody can jump in on that. Um, I was actually at a conference interest, uh, just recently where it was a little bit more clinically focused. Um, and one of the things that I was quite shocked to learn about is even at a fully clinical diagnostic lab, the amount of non-standard uh, readbacks in, in everyday assays that you would go to your PCP um, for analysis are fairly not as well controlled as, as, as the user would like it to be. Um, and so I think, obviously, as we move closer and closer to the clinic, there is a demand that these be highly standardized. Where I think I start to bifurcate a little bit is, is more on the discovery side of things. And where I think, while standardization of technology, I think, is going to be difficult, what I can see is defining, as the community, what are appropriate guidelines of quality sort of assigning, okay, what, how, what does make, and I'm going to use myself here, what does make good quality metabolomic data? What does that look like? <coughs> RSDs, certain quality control samples, and things that you can do to demonstrate to people that, yes, I have checked all of my processes. And I'm sure there are similar uh, sort of guidelines that would be useful and helpful within, within the genetic uh, community as well. Um, within the metabolomic community, we have, you know, identifications and reporting standards say, well, how confident are you in the identification of that metabolite? Did you just made, did you follow it up with the standard? Have you done extra confirmation? And I'm not even allowed to re report into a publication anymore the identification of metabolite without having a, uh, uh, this sort of meeting this criteria of what we call an MSI level one identification. So I feel that coming up with acceptable guidelines with the community is going to be a huge start within the uh, discovery mode so that we can all start talking the same language and make sure we understand um, the quality of all of our different methods and how they compare um, across technologies. I guess that's my thought on that. But I think as you get closer to the clinic, standardization of the technology itself is an absolute must. I think um, sort of building on that, um, 
I find the uh, sort of going back to sort of 16S sequencing of the microbiome is a is a nice way to, to look into that kind of standardization and, and QC, um, the QC human microbiome project um, is kind of looking at, at taking standards and then if you look across uh, sort of labs that have done the extraction and the sequencing and then labs that then do the analysis, you can actually cluster a lot of the variation that you see across the microbiome um, just purely based on sort of the techniques that were used, which is um, or in the same kind of order of magnitude from memory as, as the actual differences that are seen. So it's a, it's a little bit scary in some ways, um, although it's not more than the order of magnitude of the differences seen, so that's good. Um, so I think that that's, that's uh, sort of an interesting, because it's maybe, an, an, or, or has been around for longer, there's been a, more of a chance to progress towards that kind of um, standardization. Um, I think to add also then in a slightly different direction, uh, when you're starting to look at, and this is I guess from the perspective of, of looking towards rational design of, of interventions and therapeutics um, and more of the hypothesis driven um, uh, mechanistic approaches, I think um, certainly my feeling is that when you start to get into defining mechanisms uh, through this, it's really important to have an expectation across the community of of really making uh, as much of an effort as possible to, to look at cross-validation across different methods, so not just relying on sort of one uh, methodology, which uh, I guess the, the multi-omics approach um, helps uh, in that space, um, and then also putting effort into um, really going in and, and moving back towards, I guess, some of the more classical techniques and genetics and uh, et cetera to, to really validate um, approaches where, where that is possible. And obviously in these kind of spaces, that's not always um, a possibility, but I think it's important as something that is an expected uh, attempt to, to go to that. A question? Uh, maybe you. I can stand up and wake up the crowd on, I'll keep it close to my mouth. Uh, my name is Georgia Lahoudis. I'm from DSM Nutritional Products. Um, I've done some research in the past uh, on uh, microbiome sequencing and metagenomics and worked with a few biostatisticians. Um, but just some of what you're saying now, I think I appreciate your question about standards and I wanted to ask it with a twist, which is as we work with more data, larger amounts of data instead of 16S we're doing metagenomics and then we layer on top, um, it becomes harder to wrap our head around what is significant and what comes out of a data set that is significant. And thinking about multiple hypothesis testing, what conclusions we can draw, how do we compare across different studies, I think that's really challenging. And it's challenging also as a scientist because um, when I could look at a graph with 10 data points, it's easy for me to see group A is different from group B, but now I have 10,000 sample points. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear the panel's thoughts about how we set standards for statistical significance and how we set standards for um, validating something we find in a data set and the methods we use to claim something is significant. Well, um, I think there are uh, about as many ways to <clears throat> assign statistical significance as there are ambitious uh, statisticians in the world and I, I think you I mean I, there's been debates about p-values and whether you can trust them because obviously um, you know the null hypothesis is not true in most cases um, so I think the it, and then there's a there's also a push to get around them with Bayesian statistics which has never really taken off after you know, 20 years people just have trouble wrapping their head around it so we're kind of stuck in this p-value world and Yes, you can correct p-values and must, and I would say that that's something reviewers have gotten really good at asking about is having standards for, like, if you run multiple tests, you must correct for the fact that you ran multiple tests. But as a general recommendation, I think the easiest solution is to look at effect sizes in addition to um, the p-values. You know, and that's something that people often overlook. They'll just show that something's significant and move on. But, um, and that, that's just, I mean, it's kind of a silly answer because it applies to any field. But, um, but I do think that we should be thinking more about what are effect sizes that are meaningful, you know, in this disease and that disease. And the more we get to causal associations, the more we can actually start to 
characterize that? You know, does doubling the amount of a strain make a difference to the host? Um, which is kind of a way around the statistics. I think some of the, uh, the questions about standardization and uh, significance, now that there is more and more uh, microbiome companies that are knocking at the FDA's door, that by itself will lead to standardization and the FDA will tell you if what you're seeing is significant okay. and that's going to work their way backwards then to the early discoveries where you say to achieve a significant therapeutic effect, how do I need to run my discovery models so that I can actually see this? Uh, it's going to be a costly way of doing it, so maybe we can be a little bit smarter and be proactive in this regard, but that, it, that is definitely going to force everybody in the microbiome field to really address this head on. I just had a great idea on, on standards, by the way, um, because, you know, everyone's sort of developing their own standards, and I think sometimes there's some ego tied up into it. And, and I think what we really need is really good reference materials because the analytes change over time. Um, so my idea is we need to get a sample, stool sample, from every microbiome researcher in America, preferably in the, you know, in the, in the same bucket. And then we can make like this giant and a very reference big blender, material. Like yeah. a big blender. Like that's the standard. Yeah. Like just yeah. store, store like a million aliquots of it and that's the standard. It's a good question. NIST has I know NIST has a human plasma uh, reference material. Um, I don't know if they have a, a fecal reference material, um, but it, again, it, it's something that certainly they have a mandate to have ref standard reference materials that are highly characterized that they also know stability of because that's what they do. So it would be interesting to note if to know if NIST has anything like that as and to as a community put demand on them to create one if they don't, because I could see it being a credible value to the community. No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, does anybody know? Does NIST have a fecal? Does anybody know? Okay. Yeah. There's there's IMSA, I think, for the, the group, the International Microbiome Metagenome Standards Association. Yeah. I think NIST is, is part of that. Um, speaking personally, from a sampling company perspective, I think it'd be great to have a, a fit for purpose assay where it's like, is this okay to use or not? Has yeah. this been destroyed? Did yeah. you know, someone leave this in the trunk over the weekend? Yeah. Um, that sort of thing. But um, I, I just wanted to thank the panel for your insights um, on this gnarly issue of how to integrate you know, awesome empirical data, model it with um, synthetic biology, and, and help us make sense of it all. So thanks again for, for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.